My friend. Your eyes aren't fooling you. You're looking at a game released in 2010 with ray tracing. What if I told you that this can be done in almost any game? Games that couldn't possibly have the coding to support ray tracing. What about Breath of the Wild? Hey guys, my name is Nick, and today I'm going to be showing you how to make your games look better. Over the past couple years, a developer by the name of Pascal Gilcher has managed to implement his own ray tracing framework using a popular graphics mod called Reshade. For those of you who don't know what Reshade is, it's an injection tool that allows you to run graphics mods inside your games. I've been using Reshade for the past few years now to get more graphical fidelity out of older games, as well as games that run at extremely high frame rates. Pascal's Ray Tracing Effects Pack does require you to be a patron of at least $5 a month, but it's well worth the increase to graphical fidelity. The best part is that you don't even need an NVIDIA graphics card. This implementation doesn't utilize the tensor cores in your RTX graphics cards, but instead uses raw horsepower from your GPU to render the effects. You might be asking what might prevent a game from being able to use these effects? It basically comes down to how the game's engine is able to handle post-processing effects. Remember when I said that this program uses injection? That means it injects extra code into the program, which makes you run the risk of getting banned in certain esports titles and games that use anti-cheat software like Easy Anti-Cheat. If the game you want to mod is running at least DirectX 9 or Vulkan, and the developers haven't purposely disabled or banned DLL injection, you're pretty much good to go. Links to all the required software are provided below, so let's get started with the tutorial. Start by opening the Reshade program you downloaded and selecting your game either from the list or using the browser if you can't find the one you're looking for. Select the API that the game is running, and then choose all the effects packs you'd like to use. I'll be sticking with the first date in the list, but feel free to experiment with what's available. Click through the prompts to install the chosen packs until the installation process is done. If you're looking to do this with a Vulkan game, you'll either need to keep this program running while playing, or simply click the checkbox at the end to apply reshade to all Vulkan games. If you chose to donate monthly for the RTGI FX pack, just sign up for the $5 a month option in Patreon and connect to their Discord server. From there, you'll be able to download Pascal's shader files whenever they're updated. Put those files into the reshade shaders folder in the root of the game you installed reshade to. From here, you can start installing presets that others have created by downloading them from the website linked below and pasting the downloaded preset into the root of your game folder. If you'd like to make your own presets and you don't know where to start, keep watching and I'll show you some simple effects that'll make your game look great. I'm going to break this section down into seven parts, starting with simple effects and ending with ray tracing and lighting tweaks. The first is sharpening. There are quite a few different options when it comes to sharpening, but I primarily stick to the Delk sharpening effect. You can see immediately after enabling this effect, textures on your character's hands and the scenery in the background really start to pop. A little too much in my opinion. Sharpening is definitely an effect that benefits from the less is more approach, and after tweaking the setting to around 0.400, you can see that the texture detail is improved, while not giving everything on screen a grainy look. The next effect is anti-aliasing. Right from the start, you can tell that 10 years later, Call of Duty Black Ops is looking particularly jaggy. I've decided to turn off the native anti-aliasing inside the game, and have chosen instead to use a post-process FXAA effect. This will allow us to save some FPS, but more importantly, to preserve the depth map inside the game. This will make a little more sense once we get to the ray tracing section. When zoomed in, you can see that the FXAA shader vastly improves on the stability and the fidelity of the image. Now we'll move on to color correction, and I'm sorry if YouTube compression makes this part a little hard to see. This effect is pretty taxing when you layer it in with other effects, but it manages to completely remove the green and yellow haze that takes up the entire screen. It does remove a bit of saturation as well, but we'll be turning up the corrected colors with the next effect, Vibrance. The effect I decided to use for this preset is the Pirate Vibrance effect. 
This is another effect that I strongly recommend using less of, because if you raise it too high, it'll start blowing out all the colors on screen. You can see that if we disable the previous color correction filter while keeping Pirate Vibrance on, it only makes the green haze more apparent. Now onto ray tracing. If you didn't end up subscribing to Pascal's Patreon, feel free to skip this section. Let's go back to anti-aliasing and why I decided to turn it off for Black Ops. A lot of games that use MSAA, like Black Ops 1, will overwrite the depth buffer in the game. This means that any effects that rely on the depth buffer, like ray tracing, ambient occlusion, or depth of field, will not work with MSAA enabled. The easiest way to check if the game you're running has a compatible depth buffer, just enable the display depth effect inside Reshade. Now, turn on the RTGI effect you'll see that everything on the screen immediately gets covered in shadows. Using the ray length slider, you can adjust the length of rays cast onto the screen, which are output as bounce lighting and shading. The ray amount setting is exactly what it says, how many rays are used in the shader. This setting is what will affect your frame rate most, and typically anything over six should be reserved for screenshots as the quality increase isn't worth the performance hit. Steps per ray is similar to the ray length setting, but controls how much the scene around shaded objects are affected. Z thickness controls how thick an object has to be to receive ambient lighting and shadows. I usually like to set this low enough so that the major objects and characters are affected while trying not to overshade thin objects like grass and fences. The next three checkboxes are for various algorithms that change the nature of how the shader affects the scene, and these are very game specific so I recommend playing around with them to see what looks best for your game. The sliders after that are for changing the intensity of ambient occlusion and bounce lighting. You'll want to balance these so that objects that are lit from multiple angles receive enough shading to ground them into the scene, and enough bounce lighting to not give them a thick black border. If you want to see what just the ray tracing effect has done to the scene, hit the lighting channel option to see it working. You can even render a single frame of RTGI at maximum quality if you're into taking screenshots. Don't be afraid of going back and further tweaking the settings to get the exact image you're looking for. Here's a quick clip of the effect giving objects on this table shadows when none were there beforehand. There are a couple drawbacks to this effect, and one of them is that if you're running an older title that has a lot of 2D alpha effects, expect to see the ambient occlusion shaders on top of them. They are also visible through some HUDs and most menus. But the biggest drawback is performance. Bruh, look at this dude. <laughs> Wait till you see the. F <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, we have tone mapping and HDR. Filmic tone mapping will let you adjust the highlights and shadows on the screen, giving the illusion of better contrast. You don't want to blow out the highlights, or you'll start to see clipping in the really bright areas, like the broken wall on the top right of the screen. Same goes for shadows. You don't want to darken them too much, or you'll crush all the dark areas on the screen. You'll also want to increase the linearity a bit if you plan on using the next effect, HDR. Adjusting the sliders in this section will let you further adjust the highlights and shadows on the screen, but again, less is more. Okay, that was the final effect we're adding to the game, so let's see how it turned out. With the preset off, everything has sort of a fuzzy look to it, and pretty much every pixel is visible on screen. With all the effects on, you can see the overall aesthetic of the image is vastly improved, giving more depth and ambience to the scene. Since Halloween is around the corner, and Black Ops Cold War's hype is at its peak, I thought I'd do something a little spooky for Black Ops Zombies. Empty! I'm empty, dead, never! 
The bloodiest wars in history involve buttercups and memories. If you managed to get this far in the video, thank you. Let me know in the comments below what game you think would benefit most from this graphics mod. If you're new to the channel and you'd like to see more content like this, hit the subscribe button as well as the notification bell to make sure that you stay up to date. But other than that, my name is Nick and thanks for watching.